All right, everybody, if there is a Mount Rushmore of Grindhouse movies, then this movie must surely be on it, because this thing is the living example of perfection of that genre trapped on celluloid. Let's do it. All right, everybody, this is a special event. This is my 50th regular episode and everybody who knows me knows that I am a John Carpenter fanatic. He's my favorite director of all time and I wanted to hold on to one of his flicks and wait and wait and wait until it meant something special to put it out there. So today for my 50th episode we are looking at the classic, the phenomenal, one of my favorite motion pictures of all times, Assault on Precinct 13, 1976's Ode to Awesomeness. But before we go any further, as always, to the trailer. Freeze! This is the police. Drop your weapons and place your hands above your heads. On Saturday, six members of the gang known as Street Thunder were ambushed by the police. On Sunday, Cholo. the warlords of Street Thunder swore a blood oath to avenge their dead. For the gang called Street Thunder, it is a day of vengeance. It's war in the streets. Oh, Jesus, come on. Come on, I'll give you my money. Just don't hurt me, please. Please. It's terror in the night. It's the most shattering assault on a police station in history. Assault on Precinct 13. This is a siege. It's a goddamn siege. Stay here and hold until somebody comes, okay? We're in the middle of a city, inside a police station. What does that mean? They're not afraid to die, any of them. They want to rip us apart, no matter what it costs. It means to the death. Precinct 13, cut off, isolated in the middle of a city as a human wave of street killers turns the night into a nightmare. We got a war going on down here. We can't find the damn thing. A white-hot night of hate, assault on Precinct 13. Okay, this movie was directed and written, and just about everything else, even though he kind of threw in some fake pseudonym names, by John Carpenter. John Carpenter is my man. John Carpenter is my boy. That's all there is to it. We're talking Assault on Precinct 13. We're talking The Fog. We're talking Escape from New York. We're talking Halloween, The Thing. Big Trouble in Little China. We're talking uh, Prince of Darkness. We're talking Starman. We're talking In the Mouth of Madness. We're talking, we're talking, we're talking, we're talking. We can keep going, we can keep going. Everything that this man did between 1976 and to me about 1990, 1991 is absolutely spot on perfect the body of work needs no other introduction or nothing else said about it i'm a john carpenter fanatic i'm a john carpenter freak and this was the one that launched it all yeah he did dark star before but that whatever this is the one that really launched it all all i need to say all i have to say let's get going okay playing ethan bishop was Austin Stoker. And how can you not love anybody with the name Austin Stoker? I mean, shit, that's perfection just the way it is. Anyway, he was in movies like Airport 75. He was in stuff like uh, Shiva Baby and Horror High and Time Walker. And he's on TV on like, you know, Trapper John MD and Airwolf and Lou Grant and Cagney and Lacey and The Bold and the Beautiful. But, but, he was also in another legendary flick battle for the Planet of the Apes. So between this and between that, that's all he needed to do. I didn't give a shit about anything else he did other than this. This is phenomenal legend. Legend. Okay. Playing Napoleon Wilson. It was Darren Johnston. Now, 
How his career wasn't bigger than what it was, I don't understand to this day. I don't understand to this day. Darwin did such an incredible job in this motion picture that this should have just gotten him the leads in so many other roles. Yes, he popped up in movies, but it never really went on to be the thing that you thought it would be. Yeah, he was in Eraserhead. Yeah, he was in The Fog. Yeah, he was in uh, uh, Time Walker, obviously with Austin Stoker at one point. He was in uh, Coast to Coast. He was in Alf and Hill Street Blues and uh, uh, Knight Rider and Airwolf and uh, Remington Steel. But his career never really made, be, became the thing that you thought it would be. It, would never, it never became the thing that you, you really pictured it would turn into. But whatever, you know, I think he became like a teamster, a truck driver, and he would just drive for, uh, you know, movies and shit like that. Who would have thought? I mean, for the love of God, how he didn't become a major star, I don't know. Okay, playing Lee was Lori Zimmer. She's kind of an enigma, man. I mean, she was in another thing where she went by the name uh, Laura Fanning. She was like in one other flick or something like that. But her career just started and ended and just came and it went. It was over. I think it was another thing called Prime Time was the other flick. Her, her career really didn't do anything. She's famous for being Lori Zimmer in Assault on Precinct 13, and that's basically it. They actually had a documentary, which I wish somebody could find and give me a link to below, because I'd love to see it. But it was uh, called Do You Remember Lori Zimmer? And they went looking for her to find out what the hell ever happened to her, because she just disappeared. Turns out she became a school teacher out in California and just, I don't know much beyond that, but that's what became of her. And her career was never anything, but she was in this, and this is all that matters because for the, all of us into this kind of shit, she will always be remembered. We will always remember, we will always remember, we will always remember. Okay, playing Wells with Tony Burton. Now, Tony Burton, you know his name. I, I, maybe, okay, maybe you don't know his name, but you know his face. He was in all the Rocky movies, man. Come on! As soon as you see him, you know him. But he was in also other stuff. He, he was in The Shining. How can you not love that? He was in Inside Moves. He was on, uh, in Stir Crazy. He was on TV and stuff like Beretta and Kojak and The Six Million Dollar Man and uh, Sanford and Son and T.J. Hooker and um, uh, Moonlighting and The Fall Guy and A uh, Different World. He was, he was on a lot of stuff, man. As soon as you see him, you know him. You just think of him standing next to Apollo Creed and then sometimes Rocky Balboa, actually. Tony Burton in this. Gotta love it. Let's keep going. Okay, playing Julie was Nancy Loomis. Well, at least she was Nancy Loomis at the time. She kind of became like Nancy Keys, K-I-S, or however the hell you pronounce that later on in her life. But she was Nancy Loomis at this point in time. And she was one of Carpenter's kids, you know what I mean? She was in this. She was in Halloween. She was in The Fog. She was actually in Halloween 3. And she worked a little bit in TV and stuff like Lady Boss and The Twilight Zone from 85. She was actually married to uh, Tommy Wallace, who was like, you know, one of Carpenter's boys and always with him, making movies with him and all this other kind of stuff. But now they're divorced and she works as like a sculptor or an artist or something like that. So God bless her, whatever. Sometimes you can catch her at a horror event. She's still floating around. Hee! Okay. Playing Starker with Charles Cyphers. Now, he has been in a shitload of Carpenter work. You know what I'm talking about? Obviously, he was in this. Then he went on to be uh, Bracket in, in Halloween. And then he was Dan the Weatherman in uh, The Fog. And he also popped up in Escape from New York. But he's been in so much stuff over the years. He's been in stuff like, you know, Major League and Coming Home and Death Wish 2 and uh, Big Bad Mama 2 and Gleaming the Cube. Uh, was it Gleaming? How do you say the Gleaming the Cube. I remember it, but it's been so long. You know, he was in Loaded Weapon. He was like a zillion TV shows. Whatever. Long career, God bless him. I think they're bringing him back in one of the new Halloween Reeve spin-off, you know, forget the sequels, we're starting over again type, from two on type things. I don't know, but I, he's supposed to be in one of those. Either way, Charles Cyphers, gotta love him. Ah, damn it. Okay, and playing simply known as the White Warlord was Frank Doubleday. Now, I'm not going to tell you this man had a big stellar career. I'm not. I'm not going to tell you that he was in a bunch of stuff that you're going to remember his face instantly. Because you probably won't. But he was in this, and he played Romero in Escape from New York. What more do you need to know 
than that. The way he played Romero on Escape from New York, actually, I might not talk about that, because I'm going to save that for Escape from New York, but he was so brilliant. He made that little role so massive in that motion picture. And what he did in this was chilling, because it was kind of like the opposite. It was the devoid of humanity, where the other one was kind of like this, this over-the-top character. Frank Doubleday passed away recently. Such a shame. Never really had a career that you would think that was massive. Never had a career that was just wanted to be something big. But deserves note. He's out there. His daughter is an actress now. I think he ran up uh, acting school and shit for a while. But whatever. God bless him. Frank Dub uh, Doubleday, you know, R.I.P., brother. Okay, everybody. Here's a story. This story has multiple stories where they all converge into a convergence point which makes the motion picture happen. You really got like three or four different things going on. Four, actually. You have that there's a street gang running around and then six of their members got annihilated in the beginning of this motion picture by the police department. Hey. But they have now sworn vengeance against the police, the citizens of Los Angeles, against anybody they can. They're just going to go out there and destroy because they're pissed and they're angry that six of their men have fallen. Second, you have Lieutenant Ethan Bishop, first night on the job as a lieutenant. And once you get handed to him, this goofy bullshit assignment. He has to go down to Precinct 9, District 13, notice how it's different than the title of the motion picture, and babysit this building as it's being shut down. It's its final night of existence. The phones aren't really working, everything's closed up, everything's in boxes, and his first night on the job as a lieutenant is to go sit there and babysit this nothing building in this nothing part of town where nothing is going on. Your third factor, you have a father and his daughter, and they're going to the nanny's house, and they're going to try to convince her to come and live with them now that Fred is dead. And that's their whole point in the motion picture. They are just driving through a shitty area of town to get the woman out of the shitty area of town to come and live with them. That's their angle. And over the top of that, you have Napoleon fucking Wilson himself, prisoner being led off to death row. And you see him and two other guys being loaded on a bus and taken to a destination where he's either going to sit for the rest of his life in a cell or be executed. Napoleon Wilson is badass. He's cooler than shit and he's slicker than snot. He's mellow. You never see him snap, but he's got an aura about him of calm and cockiness and assured. Whatever it is, Napoleon Wilson is the shit. Now, of course, this motion picture has to get everybody in the same place at the same time to function, for all intents and purposes, and that's where the father and daughter come into being. Basically, the father and daughter have a run-in with the gangs. I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens. Something bad happens to them. I'm not going to tell you, uh-uh, what it is. I will tell you that the father gets some kind of retribution and has a run-in with the gang and runs to the precinct for help. The gang follows him to the precinct, the precinct which now consists of a couple cops, a couple secretaries, and some prisoners that had made a stop there because one of them on the bus trip was sick and they needed medical attention. And that's where Napoleon Wilson winds up at Precinct 9, District 13. Notice how I went back to that? That's really it. Those are what set up the story. I don't want to really tell you the story that much because I want you to see it and I want you to experience it. I know what you're saying to me, dude. You're saying, uh, uh, how can we have not have seen this? We're here because we're fans of the motion picture. Blah, blah, blah. Let me tell you something. The other day, I watched a TV show and it was about these people that evaluate animals and their behavior in motion pictures. And the guy was in his mid-30s. He was an animal expert and he had never seen Jaws. That's why I don't want to give away too much of the story. A little bit of a setup, but I'm not going to tell you what happens because this is meant for people that have never seen it to experience it, and it's for people that have seen it and love it to wait till I get to the summation to tell you why I love it. Okay, everybody, I'm going to tell you why this motion picture works. It works on every goddamn level you can possibly imagine. The directing is so far removed and superior over anything of its genre, over anything of the grindhouse kind of low budget area. It's shot super wide angle. It's got this beautiful, beautiful, 
beautiful scenic shots all through the motion picture that are just masterful. That's what Carpenter can do. He can take these shots that seem simple and make them into something that is just majestic. He was a master at that and he could make you feel alone in the middle of a city. Carpenter was amazing with that. I don't care if it was this, Escape from New York, Halloween, The Thing, whatever. If you want to feel isolation and you want to feel alone, John Carpenter is your man. There is nobody else better. That's just the way it goes. Now, he had two things that really inspired him for this thing. He had Rio Bravo, a movie he was a big fan of, and Night of the Living Dead. And that's one of the things that also comes across in this motion picture. The gang members are almost inhuman. They are just, they don't talk, they don't speak. Through the whole motion picture, one gang member early on says something like, you know, for the six. And that's it. That is literally it. There's dozens of them in this motion picture. They're all the way throughout the motion picture. None of them speak. They have almost a zombie-like presence to them, thanks to the Night of the Living Dead influence that Carpenter said he had going into this motion picture. It was so eerie and so bizarre and so weird that you almost forgot you were watching gang members attacking these people. You're like, oh my God, it's just like the hordes of the dead coming in to get these guys. It was so, so different and so, so weird. And then you have, you know, guys trapped in a precinct doing guy things. And they had some tough chicks with them. Well, one tough chick and the other chick was kind of a flake. But, and they're all in there surviving. The good guys, the bad guys, everybody together, everybody fighting off this insane horde of evil and the dead or but gang members in this motion picture. It was so different and it was so unique and it was so well shot and it was so well written and so well directed, so well scored. The music to this is some of my favorite motion picture music of all times. It's amazing. I mean, you might think of, you know, Carpenter, you think of Halloween or Escape from New York theme or something like that. This 110% belongs right near the top of his list, especially the beautifully and scarily, hauntingly done Julie's theme, which is just the name of the song, but it was just amazing, amazing, amazing. Assault on Precinct 13 had a remake done several years later. Don't watch it. Watch this. Much like John Carpenter's whole career, they had been just remaking everything he's ever done, but making a shit comparison to what the original was. This motion picture was a time when men were men and women were women. And action was action. This motion picture is unapologetic. It's in your face. It's dark. It's gritty. It's real, yet fantasy. It's grounded in reality, yet it has an air of almost the supernatural. It is just a complete, utter thrill ride from beginning to end with a couple strange little moments of levity. The Napoleon Wilson character, let's face it, everybody, that character is the precursor to the character we all know and love, Snake Plissken. You look at Napoleon Wilson, you look at Snake Plissken, and you can see that they are almost an extension of one another, or a growth of the other. They're not that far from each other. If you like Snake Plissken, you're going to like Napoleon Wilson, and that's just the way that shit goes. Okay, folks, I could rant on all night about how much I love this motion picture, but all that is meaningless. I want you guys to go out there and see this motion picture. I implore everybody, of all the shit I've reviewed, of all the movies I've done, of all the ones I might do, if you haven't seen this motion picture, go out and watch it. I, I know it's out there on all the streamers. I even seen somebody had uploaded the whole damn thing to YouTube. If you got any way possible, any time on your hands, watch this movie truly, truly one of the all-time great flicks, not even just of Grindhouse, but to me, of action 70s cinema. Pure awesomeness on celluloid. Okay, everybody, I hope you had fun. This is just a look back at something that really meant a lot to me. So have a good time. Go out, take care of each other, love one another, be good to each other, never hurt a stranger, and don't take no shit from nobody. Peace, everybody. Bye.